Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. So what you end up with is distributed nature of the counterparty risk in these key agents, but you still have segregated Bitcoin that you legally control in a two of three multi-sig vault, and you can interact with it in the exact same way as if you were holding those keys. There is no substitute for self-custody, so don't get me wrong there, but this is about as close as you can get to being able to interact with Bitcoin as if you do hold those keys while still being able to offload some of that responsibility to, to these institutional key agents. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is a return guest, Trey Sellers, who is now the VP of Enterprise Sales at Unchained. In case you're not aware of Unchained, Unchained serves individuals and organizations with a range of Bitcoin custody options and a premier suite of financial services. Trey himself has an extensive background across sales and consulting in the banking and financial services industries, and in his role at Unchained, Trey takes a consultative approach to helping enterprises, institutional investors, family offices, and high net worth individuals acquire and secure Bitcoin. I wanted to bring Trey back on the podcast to talk about Unchained's new collaborative custody model, where they have different key agents holding the keys for a particular organization. There are certainly trade-offs, but I think overall, this is a really great option for a lot of organizations that might be leery about holding their own keys, at least at first. Of course, before we get to today's interview, I want to give a shout out to those who have been supporting the show on Fountain in the last week, and then we're going to get to this week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight. Thanks so much to those who have been streaming Sats, the podcast, including user 7530895, user 10920643, user 59407825, and Ilde Pickman. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thanks also to Piez, who sent a 980 sat boost and said, Happy Turkey Day. Same to you. Happy Thanksgiving to all of those, especially in the U.S. who celebrated Thanksgiving, although I know that others celebrate it as well. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can listen on Fountain and either stream sats as you listen or send a boost with a message, which I will read on this show. This week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight is the Proof of Drink Meetup in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Bitcoin Proof of Drink Meetup is the longest running Bitcoin meetup in Louisiana. Meetups are scheduled for the first Tuesday of each month, and the next meetup will be on December 5th at 6 p.m. at the Bulldog in Baton Rouge. Whether you're a curious beginner or seasoned pleb, they have the right level of one-on-one -on -one interaction to keep you entertained and informed. Come join them for the best Bitcoin discussions in South Louisiana. You can find them on Twitter at BTCPODMeetup. That link's down below, along with a link to the Oshi app, which you can use to find a Bitcoin meetup near you. Now, we're going to get to our interview with Trey right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27-page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. Trey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate you having me back. I'm excited for the conversation. So I'd like to start off every single interview with a few questions that help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. Since you're a repeat guest, we change up the first question. And that question is, what is the part of the Bitcoin rabbit hole you've been going down most recently? Yeah, so I don't know if there's a specific part of the rabbit hole, so to speak, that I've been going down recently, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a story that uh, came from really just this past weekend. Um, when I was first really going down the technical side of Bitcoin, um, I was playing with all kinds of different keys and uh, hardware devices and all that. And I, 
I moved my funds, a significant amount of it, into a multi-sig setup that I had set up with Spectre Desktop, um, which was a fairly new tool at the time. And I tested it multiple ways and all of that. Uh, and the configuration that they were using back then, years ago, um, it's not overly compatible with some of the other tools that are out there now. So now I like to use Sparrow Wallet. I've got my vault built uh, you know, at Unchained, but I like to connect that into Sparrow so that I can look at, um, at my transaction history through the lens of my own node, right? I'm fully verifying the transactions that, um, that I've done on my own hardware, my own software of Bitcoin that I'm running and controlling. Um, and uh, I was having a hard time actually being able to spend those funds from that tool. And I realized it had something to do with the uh, what's called the derivation path that the uh, Spectre tool that I was using all those years ago had had done. And so, um, of course, hours and hours go by, I'm troubleshooting, I'm making some progress. And what I found out is that um, Unchained's tool, uh, which is open source and hosted on GitHub called Caravan, uh, is actually very flexible and very useful for these types of situations. Um, it accepts a lot of different configurations. And I was able to actually sign a transaction and spend these funds that I could have figured out by re-downloading Spectre and, and going through that whole process, um, but I didn't want to. I wanted to use these other tools that are at my disposal. Uh, and so a lot of that technical stuff I really enjoy playing around with. Uh, and so that's kind of a recent rabbit hole that I, that I went down uh, on the technical side of Bitcoin. So in recent conversations on the podcast, we've talked about how people who have a particular skill set, but maybe are not so strong in others, come to Bitcoin and are often incentivized to kind of level up in different areas. Maybe that's something we can touch on later, since you said you, when you came to Bitcoin, you weren't particularly technical, but you certainly developed those skills. But for now, let's go ahead sure. and move to question number two. And what's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish everyone understood? The biggest insight that I've had probably in my entire um, history of being in Bitcoin and, and trying to understand it is that you make the rules. And so I was kind of hinting at this in the uh, response to the first question, which is that the software that you choose to run on your own hardware, uh, the tools that you use to uh, interact with Bitcoin or the money that you choose to use, you are free to choose that. And nobody else can mm. force you to run different code uh, or force you to download something and agree to terms or agree to a rule set that you don't agree to. So for instance, mm -hmm. I will never ever run Bitcoin software on my machine that stipulates that the supply of Bitcoin is more than 21 million. That 21 mm -hmm. million is not something that I'm outsourcing to the rest of the network. It is something that I am voluntarily opting into that I control for my own money. It just ha so happens to coincide with everybody else and them opting into that same rule set such that we create a network and we can all communicate value to one another over, over space and time. Um, but that, that realization, after I started running my own Bitcoin node and, and understanding what was happening there and how it was communicating with the rest of the network, that was really one of the biggest revelations that I've had that, that kind of solidified Bitcoin's value proposition as something that you control, that nobody else can force you to uh, into a rule set that you do not agree to. I would say closely connected to that. I saw a, a meme or a screenshot today. Someone was saying, uh, basically juxtaposing the banking system in Bitcoin. They said they got a notification from their bank that their transaction was approved. And then they got a notification that their Bitcoin transaction had been confirmed. And it seems like the approval versus confirmation seems like a small difference at first, but it really goes to show you that you don't have to play by other people's rules when you're running Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, and uh, it, it's a it's a really nice way of boiling it down. You don't have to ask anybody for permission on the money that you want to use. You can opt yep. into a rule set that you agree to. Uh, hopefully, the rest of the world agrees to use that as well, because the value of any kind of money is directly and very strongly correlated with the size of the network of the other people who are using that money and the the depth of the liquidity they're in but um but that doesn't mean that you are forced to use that right you could choose to run a different set of rules mm -hmm. um but you might not have other people there to play with you and to <laughs> to exchange value with so question number three what's the bitcoin resource you most recommend to other people so recently, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two. I think the last time I was on the mm -hmm. show, I gave you the bullish case for Bitcoin by VJ Boypati. Uh, that's still a great resource. 
Um, I'm going to give you a couple of others. The first is a tool, which is Phoenix Wallet. Um, I've been using Phoenix as my go-to lightning wallet on my mobile device um, for uh, uh, quite a while now. And I've gotten even more and more embedded in using that because it just works so well. It's so easy. Um, I like the idea of running kind of a lightweight node on my phone and being able to be in in full control of my private keys um, the way that I like to interact with with all of my Bitcoin, if at all possible. Um, so that's a really great tool that, that people should check out. Um, the other is more of a informational resource that I find very valuable in speaking, especially to people from the traditional financial world. Um, my background is from banking, it's from traditional finance. Um, and uh, Fidelity, a couple of years ago, put out a report called Bitcoin First. And it talks about the value of Bitcoin, the differences between um, Bitcoin and crypto, and why Bitcoin absolutely has value. And let's just say very uh, generously that the jury's still out on some of this other stuff, and that anybody who's coming into the space really needs to understand the value proposition of Bitcoin before they even go about exploring anything else there. Um, they just mm -hmm. released a, kind of a revised version that, that brings some, some data up to date. But that resonates very well with a lot of the people that I'm speaking to from the traditional finance world. And in my role at Unchained, when I'm talking to enterprises and institutions and large family offices, they are used to talking about things the way that Fidelity approaches it in this report. Uh, and then just having their logo at the top of there goes a long way in terms of credibility. So people who might otherwise not be open to reading about or trying to understand Bitcoin, as soon as their interest is peaked, having that logo at the top really kind of gets them over the hump to say, okay, well, maybe yeah. this is not so crazy after all. You know, Fidelity is is putting out a 20-page report on it, right? Maybe I should take it a little more seriously. That's excellent. So question number four, beyond Bitcoin, what is a resource tool or idea that's been helpful to you or your work at Unchained recently? Uh, you probably get this a lot, but uh, chat GPT is by far the you know, non-Bitcoin related tool that I'm using the most these days and getting a lot of value out of. I've messed around a lot with trying to create content with it and, and really go like the distance in doing that. I found it actually very difficult to do. It's not quite good enough to get across the points that I would be making if I were writing it myself. And then I end up spending a lot of time uh, actually trying to correct it and get it to say the things that I kind of wanted to say. Um, but it's very, very good for idea generation, for structuring, um, for just um, generally like exploring new areas of an idea that you otherwise uh, might not be able to think about doing, you know, without having that prompting. Um, and so I, I found it extremely valuable. Um, I play around a lot with, you know, Dolly 3 that's embedded in there and mid-journey as well and the image generation stuff. So just broadly, the the whole AI thing is is really interesting to me. And I think there's a lot of um, overlap in terms of the use case for AI and the use case for Bitcoin, um, such that there's going to be uh, a lot of, um, you know, Bitcoin embedded into the AI tools that we start to see over the next three, four, five years. So when it comes to prompts, could you maybe give some business owners listening right now an idea of how they can use it to help them to explore a topic more deeply or expand their thinking in a certain area? Um, you don't have to give specific examples necessarily, but some prompt ideas, because that's one of the most difficult things. Like what is a prompt that's actually going to get the result that I'm looking for? There really are no hard and fast rules. There definitely are some shortcuts. Uh, so the first thing to say is like, you will learn a lot by just going in and playing around with it. You don't have to have like some magic set of words. Um, start with something and then iterate from there. You can literally have a conversation uh, as if it's a real person and tell it, no, that's not quite what I meant. I meant this. Um, so, but let's say you want to explore uh, the topic of Bitcoin, right? You're trying to learn a little bit. Um, go into ChatGPT and just say, hey, give me 10 facts about Bitcoin or give me 10 different perspectives about Bitcoin. Um, and then start from, from there as a starting point and then just kind of dig into the ones that look interesting to you. Um, when you're trying to craft an argument uh, or craft some type of um, you know, piece of writing, a really good way to explore different ideas or different ways of approaching that is to just throw it into ChatGPT and say, hey, can you give me a couple of variations on how to say this? I'm trying to uh, influence this person to do X, or I'm trying to um, 
help them understand why and and see what it gives you and a lot of times it will it will show you something that you wouldn't have thought on your own uh, and it's not that you can necessarily just take that copy and paste it and you're good to go but it can help to shape the way that you communicate with people um, such that it's uh, it's it's beneficial to a different way of them understanding or for you communicating. Now we have our final, what we call our arbitrary but insightful question, and it's this. As a general life principle, is it better to ask why or why not? I can't remember how I answered this the first time. I think I said a little bit of both, which is a cop-out. I'm going to go with why not today. Perfect. <laughs> um, I was listening to a podcast the other day on the Wright brothers and mm. their journey to uh, you know build a flying machine and, and have man fly. And, you know... So much of that story is just driven by the fact that these guys, um, they were able to dream and say, like, why not? Why can't we figure this out? Um, let's break down the problem. Let's go through it step by step um, and figure out how to get lift and then figure out how to control in the air and and start experimenting on small ways so that we can uh, solve this problem that most of the world thought could never in a million years be solved. Um, the New York Times is a, a very long history of saying things that turn out to be spectacularly wrong. Uh, flight was one of them. They're basically saying like, never in a million years will man fly. And then it was like, you know, five or 10 years later that the Wright brothers are actually building flying machines yeah. and the rest is history from there. Um, so mm. ask yourself why not, and then go figure out uh, how to solve that problem. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin-focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices, and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard-earned profits and retained earnings. At Linkster, it's not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting Linkster.com. That's L-Y-N-C-S-T-E-R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Vellus Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. Vellus Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Vellus is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart Vellus Commerce doesn't just build, they bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Vellus Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future proof your business in the coming age of hyper Bitcoinization, head over to VellusCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Vellus Commerce. Let's make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. Perfect. Well, Trey, we're here today to talk about Unchained. And particularly, I reached out to you when I saw that there's a new approach to custody for businesses in particular. But this is collaborative custody model that we're going to be talking about today. But before that, uh, your your job title has had a recent glow up. So would love to hear from you about what you're doing now at Unchained. And then we'll get into talking about the collaborative custody. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so I'm a senior member of our sales team here at Unchained. Uh, I've been with the company for uh, almost two and a half years now. Uh, which is kind of a long time in in Bitcoin time. <laughs> and um, I've worked with clients of all shapes and sizes, uh, mostly individuals, high net worth individuals who have a decent amount of Bitcoin and they want to protect it in the best possible way. And the primary relationship that we've had with our clients um, is around custody. They're looking for the best way to secure their Bitcoin and they want to hold their own keys. They understand the value of them picking the rules, right? As we were talking about earlier of them being in, in control of their money. Um, and that is very appealing to a lot of people who understand this. And it's very, um, it's very interesting to a subset of people who are interested in Bitcoin and want to take it to, to that, uh, that best level for security. But there are a lot of people who 
uh, are not quite ready for that yet. Um, there are a lot of institutions and enterprises and large family offices um, who can't for regulatory reasons, uh, for uh, something that their auditor is telling them, um, or for their comfort level, are not able to hold uh, private keys. And so what we've done is start to expand the custody options that we make available uh, to our clients. So instead of just a two of three multi-sig um, uh, custody solution where our clients are fully in control of the Bitcoin by holding their own private key material, we're there alongside them to, to make sure that we can help them recover and, and manage that and provide support. Um, now our clients have the ability to start delegating the key management responsibility for their multi-signature vault to other institutions uh, in, in that same two of three type of quorum. And those professional independent institutions um, are building their business on protecting an enterprise grade key, the same way that Unchained has been doing for the past seven, eight years, um, such that our clients can come into a extremely strong security posture where they're not relying on a single black box institution, a single custodian, um, but they're instead distributing the counterparty risk that they are taking on there across independent institutions that would have to collude uh, in order for them to uh, you know, have their funds stolen or would have to all be compromised at the same time in order for the Bitcoin to be lost. Um, that's It's kind of a sea change in the way that uh, Bitcoin custody has been approached up to this point, um, mm -hmm. and it's leveraging this native functionality that Bitcoin has uh, in in multi signature. Um, that is really a new model for custody of of any asset, and it's something that's unique to Bitcoin, right? Like you can't custody a gold bar spread across multiple counterparties. Um, it's a physical, you know, non starter. Um, but with Bitcoin, because we're dealing with information, um, because we're dealing with cryptography here, we can actually distribute the uh, the counterparty risk um, across multiple institutions instead of stacking layers of counterparty risk with a single institution. So the way that most people are familiar with Unchained, whether it's for their own Bitcoin or Bitcoin connected to their business, is that they control a key and Unchained controls a key. And I think it's Kingdom Trust, whichever whichever institution it is, you and two others hold keys. Could you talk a little bit more about what the collaborative custody looks like as far as, let's say, three different institutions are holding keys? How does the individual or how does the organization get access to that when they want to? Yeah, so we've uh, employed this collaborative custody model uh, with other institutions as part of our loan product for years now. Um, the way that that works is very similar to the way that the collaborative custody model works um, just in our custody product in that Unchained holds a key, our client holds a key, and then Kingdom Trust is that um, third-party key agent that is collaborating with, uh, with us and our client to secure the Bitcoin collateral for that loan in a way that is segregated, in a way that is transparent, uh, and in a way that is going to maximize the um, the chances that our clients are going to get that Bitcoin back at the end of the loan term, right? They're really only um, at risk of the price movements related to that margin uh, process, uh, as opposed to depositing their Bitcoin with a single institution where that single institution could be hacked or they could lend it out from underneath them and expose them to other layers of counterparty risk that they can't even see. Um, that same two of three model is what we're using in this delegated custody model as well. And so our clients have the option to hold zero keys or one key as part of that. Um, they're using Unchained as one of those key agents. We're, we're always going to be a part of that, at least for now. Um, and then they're delegating uh, one or two of their keys that they could otherwise be holding to these other institutions. Um, so the uh, the Two institutions that we have already announced are Kingdom Trust, which we already had this partnership with, and CoinCover. Um, and then we actually uh, just signed an agreement with Bact. There's going to be an announcement by the time that this podcast comes out um, as a third key agent that uh, our clients can choose from. So they can pick their quorum of key agents um, based off of what they're offering in terms of an SLA for signing and the security mechanisms that um, you know, that they would like to kind of opt into. We've, of course, pre-vetted 
all of these key agents and wouldn't bring them into our platform if we weren't comfortable with them being a part of, of the quorum with our clients. Um, but uh, again, you're, you're distributing the key management in a way that you don't have a single counterparty that can lose the Bitcoin on your behalf um, and that would have to collude against you. And perhaps these are in different jurisdictions, right? CoinCover operates out of the UK, Unchained and, and King Trust are operating out of the US. Um, over time, we'll be adding more and more key agents. Maybe they are operating out of Asia or out of South America. And so you can get this um, geographic dispersion of these key agents as well, um, further and further uh, pushing out the risk uh, of any kind of malfeasance from happening in a single institution uh, or any type of natural disaster that might otherwise affect the Bitcoin that you own. And so what you end up with is distributed nature of the counterparty risk in these key agents, but you still have segregated Bitcoin that you legally control in a two of three multi-sig vault, uh, and you can interact with it in the exact same way as if you were holding those keys. Um, there is no substitute for self-custody, so don't get me wrong there, but this is about as close as you can get uh, to being able to interact with Bitcoin as if you do hold those keys, um, you know, while still being able to offload some of that responsibility to to these institutional key agents. And I appreciate that you said that you're right. There's there's no second best when it comes to custody. You know, if you if you have self custody, that's the most important thing. Not all organizations are going to want to do, to do that. And in just a second, I'd like to hear from you about kind of either. The, the types of responses you've been getting from larger institutions or others who are interested in this model. But first, I think it'd be interesting to kind of hear your response to what I'm sure other people have probably brought up in the past, which is, is there any concern about collusion between a sufficient number of organizations to get access to the Bitcoin? Or is it that these key agents have such little control that they can't really do that, even if they're working in tandem with other key agents? Yeah. So it's important to realize, one, I just said, right, there's no substitute for self-custody. So mm -hmm. when you are using a delegated custody model, like what we are offering here, you are trusting a quorum of other institutions to not collude against you. Mm -hmm. The trade-off here is that you are able to get access to spot Bitcoin and you're able to legally control that segregated Bitcoin that you can mm -hmm. see and, and transparently see like on the blockchain, you could load your vault um, uh, configuration into a tool like Sparrow or Spectre, like we were talking about before, and actually see the Bitcoin UTXOs that you own on chain. And you know that it's sitting there separate from everybody else's. But I want you to, to think about the difference here when you are using three different institutions and the fact that they would have to collude against you in order to move the Bitcoin out instead of a single institution, which requires no collusion with other legally independent institutions, they can just take the Bitcoin or they can just mm -hmm. lend it out or they can um, lose it because some type of support person is socially engineered in order to move the Bitcoin out in, in a direction that you didn't want it to go, right? They're, they're able to spoof the identity of a controller uh, or a finance person in your organization. Um, those are the types of things that happen all the time with trusted exchanges and single institutions. Uh, and so you're going from a scenario where you have a single point of failure in terms of a single institution to eliminating that single point of failure. That does not mean that things could not go wrong in a much more elaborate way with multiple institutions, but it does dramatically decrease the risk that you are uh, in a position where you're losing your Bitcoin either from a mistake at that custodial institution uh, or collusion across both, uh, you know, more than one. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to explain that. And even uh, this last week, and certainly in the last year, we've seen examples of people who had their own setups for their Bitcoin that have lost access to it. So th there, there are things that can go wrong no matter what your setup is. There are always points of failure, even if you are the one who controls all those potential points of failure. Our mission is to make it easy for our clients to get access mm -hmm. to Bitcoin and eliminate as much counterparty risk as possible in doing that. Um, you can fully eliminate that counterparty risk when you take full control of your Bitcoin, uh, but you can drastically reduce it by um, using this collaborative custody model. Mm -hmm. And and so 
our goal is to provide a path, provide a, a journey for clients who may be new to Bitcoin. I think we're going to see a lot of this uh, over the next few years. People are going to want to get exposure to Bitcoin because they see the price going up. They see everybody talking about it. We're going to have this you know, euphoria in the market. And there are going to be a lot of family offices and a lot of corporates and a lot of institutions who want to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. But they either can't or they're not a, they don't feel comfortable holding their own keys. Well, we provide a path for that. You can start by delegating all of your key responsibility to these um, you know, multiple institutions. And then when you start to feel comfortable with the fact that you just own Bitcoin and you have to account for it and all of this, then you can move down the path a little bit and start to hold one key. Uh, and by holding one key, you now have cryptographic verifiability that that Bitcoin is there. You can participate directly in the transactions and the other key agents know for sure that it was you who is authorizing that transaction because you control that key. So there are a lot of benefits actually from going from zero keys that you're controlling to one. And then if you're able and if you're ready to move to full self-custody, and I hope we get there with a lot of institutions, then we have that path for you as well. And we're going to incentivize that. The fewer keys that you hold, the less you're going to pay. It's going to be a little bit more expensive if you're going to delegate more responsibility and bring in more uh, you know, uh, institutional players into your security setup. So uh, the flip side of that is you're going to be rewarded in terms of the cost of uh, securing that Bitcoin by taking on more responsibility as an organization and getting closer and closer to that self-custody model that we all you know, want to get to in order to just maximize the resiliency that the Bitcoin network and our, this new monetary system has built within it. So I appreciate you going through all of that. I love the fact that you're really focused on getting people to own spot Bitcoin as opposed to, for instance, the ETF, mm -hmm. and then getting people increasingly closer to controlling their Bitcoin in as much as they feel comfortable doing that, incentivizing it through how much it costs, for instance. So maybe before we finish up, because I think this you've you've answered the question that I was going to ask, which is, given that that self custody is always the the best option what does this open up for institutions for different organizations i think you've already answered that question pretty well but i did want to kind of give you a chance to talk about any other services or products that Unchained provides that might be beneficial to business owners. I know a lot of people in the space are already familiar, but in case there's someone who's not familiar with Unchained or as familiar maybe as uh, they could be, what are some other things that business owners can be thinking about for themselves and or employees for the future? Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned before, the question of custody is really the anchor point for the majority of the relationships that we have with our clients. Um, from a business or an enterprise or an institutional standpoint, um, our clients are holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Uh, they are using it as a treasury reserve. Uh, we work with a lot of mining clients who are, you know, have Bitcoin in their treasury or they're using it as part of their operations. Uh, we have other businesses who accept Bitcoin uh, as payments for their services, uh, which is a really nice feature to have that Bitcoin does, especially if you do a lot of international business and that kind of thing. And so really everything is built around a custody model that gives you options on how you want to interact with your Bitcoin and the amount of responsibility that you want to take, like we were talking about. Um, from there, we help people buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, you can do that directly with us. Uh, we have Bitcoin-backed loans as well. Uh, we are one of the few institutions that are still standing after um, you know the last couple of years of, of price volatility and unscrupulous institutions taking customer Bitcoin and doing things that they didn't really know about like lending it out um, or um, you know taking undue risk with it and leveraging it to trade their own book and that kind of thing uh, we don't do that as I was explaining before we have no legal ability even to rehypothecate uh, the Bitcoin that are part of those loans. And that's why we're still standing here. And, and that product has been so successful. Um, and on the individual side, we have Bitcoin IRAs, we have uh, white glove service uh, and and customer support options that, that kind of run the gamut for um, as much or as little interaction as you want to have with our team, the experts that we have working here. Um, we have the, the best people in the world helping our clients to secure Bitcoin in the best possible way. Um, and so 
uh, those range of options give us the ability to serve people where they are and and interact with them at the level that they want to be interacting uh, with us uh, and then provides enterprises and institutions and large family offices um, and and ultra high net worth individuals uh, the type of uh, very hands-on service that they have come to expect when they are paying you know large amounts of money in order to secure their assets that they're holding uh, for for a long period of time um, mm -hmm. so we, we, our client base really spans, uh, you know, across the board. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we absolutely love being on this mission to help people to hold Bitcoin in the most secure way um, possible and then maximize its value through these other financial services that we offer. And I want to be conscious of your time, but I did want to take a brief second to ask you about Bitcoin Expedition that you spoke at a few weeks ago. We've interviewed John Ruth just recently from Build Asset Management uh, and talked a little bit about the event right before it happened. But uh, my understanding is that a lot of that event was people from the Jefferson City, Missouri area who weren't necessarily already Bitcoiners. I'm assuming a, a decent amount of Bitcoiners showed up as well, but I'm just curious what your your thoughts, reflections, your experience was when it comes to that event and especially getting the opportunity to talk to a bunch of people who may not yet have been Bitcoiners. Yeah, well, uh, the first thing I'll say is um, I, I go to a lot of Bitcoin events. I go to a lot of mm -hmm. conferences, um, large and small, and um, this one was was really special. Uh, this is the first uh, event that the build uh, team has has thrown, at least of that magnitude that I'm aware of. And they did an unbelievably good job at maintaining a good pace and providing some really interesting and valuable content. And most importantly, you were hitting on this, bringing new people into the fold. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in Jefferson City, Missouri. It's kind of right in between Kansas City and St. Louis. And so I think there was a class uh, from Wash U that came in uh, for a portion of it. There were a lot of people from Kansas City and, and uh, all around the area who were interested in learning about Bitcoin for the first time in some cases. And so I had a lot of interesting conversations with people who we're going through the same process that you and I have gone through to try to understand and wrap your head around what this thing is and why it's valuable uh, and why they should be paying attention to it. Um, we're going to see droves and droves of these people over the next couple of years. Yep. And so it's really nice to have events like that that are focused on making sure that these people start to understand why you and I have devoted so much time and energy to Bitcoin because we see it as so valuable for um, you know for our personal lives as well as for you know society at large. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to the next two or three years here. I think it'll be a very exciting time. Trey, I really appreciate you sharing today, especially about the the collaborative custody model, helping people think through what's best for their situation, their level of comfort with Bitcoin, and and kind of those ranges there that people can be thinking through. You have any final thoughts or places that you want people to go? after listening to today's episode. Final thoughts? I don't think so. I think we covered it all. Um, you can find me on Twitter at TS underscore HODL. Uh, I have a personal website, traysellers.com. And then you know I'm on LinkedIn if you want to try to connect with me there. Uh, but otherwise, go to unchain.com. Um, check out all of the, the different options that we have for custody, for trading, for, for loans, for the IRA, if you're an individual and have some retirement funds that are locked in the fiat financial system that you want to get some, some Bitcoin exposure to. Um, and, and come talk to us. We offer uh, complimentary consultations uh, that allow you to really ask the questions that are on your mind to get you comfortable with the next steps and what this would look like for you personally. Um, how you would manage the security of your Bitcoin and how you would maximize its value through those other financial services that we offer. Uh, so come talk to us. Really looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, Trey, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Josh. Well, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. If you want to reach out to either me or Trey, you can find those links down in the show notes. And if you're interested in the institutional custody or any of the other solutions that Unchained provides, be sure to reach out to them as well. As always, keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. 
If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boosts on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn sats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today